Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center. If you would like to have a live transcript during this program, you can do that by clicking the option Live Transcript at the bottom of your screen and then click Show Subtitles. The Holocaust Center for Humanity, located in downtown Seattle, sits on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. The Coast Salish people, which is an umbrella term for numerous tribes, which had some shared traditions and languages, and they inhabited the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. We honor with gratitude the land itself and those who came before us, stewarded the land, and remain leaders and activists within our communities. The Holocaust Center for Humanity is open every Sunday from 10 to 4. And whether or not you have been there, I invite you to come and visit, take in a story, leave a note in our memorial wall, and help us to remember, preserve, educate, and take action. The first Sunday of every month, including this past Sunday, Holocaust survivor Peter Metzlar is in the museum and available to answer any questions you might have. It is September and it is back to school season. The Holocaust Center's education programs are running at full speed to accommodate the many requests from teachers as they plan their year. This week, the Holocaust Center is partnering with Gonzaga University in Spokane to offer a series of programs on Americans and the Holocaust. This includes a public community program in person at Gonzaga, teacher workshops, and an exhibit from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And you can find out more about these programs uh, through the link that is in the chat. The conversation on Americans' role in the Holocaust continues in the middle of September with a special new series on September 18th, 19th, and 20th on PBS or KT KCTS 9 or your local PBS station. This new three-part series by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein examine the rise of Hitler and Nazism in Germany in the context of global anti-Semitism and racism, the eugenics movement in the United States, and race laws in the American South. The series sheds light on what the US government and American people knew and did as the catastrophe unfolded in Europe. There's a link in the chat also to find out more information about that upcoming three-part series. Understanding our role historically helps us to better understand how we as individuals and as a country have a responsibility to respond to genocides and human rights abuses around the globe. We at the Holocaust Center have the best community of Lunch and Learn viewers. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. Because this is such a special community of people who love to learn, we are putting together an opportunity for you. On November 8th, we will be holding our annual Voices for Humanity event. Voices for Humanity is a fundraiser that is powered by the people like you, and that makes it possible for us to do this work throughout the year. This year, the event will be both in-person and virtual. On November 8th, we are putting together a special table just for our Lunch and Learn viewers. This is a chance for you to meet one another in person if you choose or virtually. Did you know that at every Lunch and Learn program, there are hundreds of you that tune in to take part and even more who watch the program after it's aired. This is an incredible community of learners and I'm excited to get some of you together in the same room at the Sheraton in Seattle or in a virtual space on November 8th. There's a link in the chat where you can register or you can find all the information on our website. And when you register, look for the field called event host. You will see an option for lunch and learn guests. You can also just add that to the notes section on your registration. Today we have with us a speaker who can personalize this large history of the Holocaust and who can take the enormous numbers and make them into real people who grappled with impossible decisions, tragic loss, and eventually the opportunity to rebuild in the United States. Beverly Silver is a career art educator who has worked extensively in K through 12 public and private schools, museum and university settings. 
She directed educational programs for the general public and special audiences at Bellevue Art Museum. And recently she retired from Seattle University where she directed the job placement office in the College and Education, College of Education and currently serves as an adjunct instructor. Beverly is one of the newest members of the Holocaust Center's Speakers Bureau. We will take questions at the end of the program. Please enter your questions at any time through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, Beverly, for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alana. And I will just share my screen. One moment. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I am glad to be here. I'm glad to share my family story with you. It's titled Journey to Freedom. And here you see my parents, uh, Malcolm and Johanna Moss. My mother was 21 in this photo and it was taken the year before she came to the United States. And my father was uh, 34 in his photo and it was taken shortly after he arrived in the States. So why am I telling my family story? Well, certainly I want to honor my parents' memory, their courage, their perseverance, and their resilience. And I also really believe in the power of personal stories to inform, to educate, and to inspire people. And my hope is that my family's personal Holocaust story can be a meaningful and a lasting way for you to learn something about the dangers of anti-Semitism and racism. Under primary sources, uh, you'll notice that I've included historical photos as well as family photos and documents and show out testimony. So you will be seeing video interview clips from my mother and you'll be able to hear from her directly. And I do wanna thank the Holocaust Center for all their work in the creation of this presentation from start to finish. My mother's story begins in Bad Neustadt, Germany. It's a small city in uh, central Germany in the Bavarian region. It's about a hundred miles uh, northeast of Frankfurt and it's a beautiful city. It's on the Saal River and it's known for its natural mineral springs. This is a, a postcard of Bad Neustadt from more modern times. And it, you can see it's very picturesque. My mother said it looked like something out of a fairy tale. It was built in medieval times. So for four generations, my mother's family lived in Germany. For over 200 years, they were upstanding German citizens. My mother would say they were good Germans and they were good Jews. They were homeowners, property owners, business owners, uh, military veterans. My grandfather, Alfred Stern, served in the German army during World War I. And here you see two of the medals that he was awarded for his service. When the war was over, he was pleased to return home and join his parents as a partner in the family business. It was called Stern and Son, and it was a dry goods store. They sold yarns and fabrics. And Alfred, he saw his long-term future in the business. He wanted to expand it and create a, a wholesale division. And he was one of the first people in Bad Neustadt to buy a car so he could take business trips and generate new business. And on one of those trips to a rural uh, nearby town of uh, Tiefenort, he met his future bride, Berta Le uh, Levestein. Berta was also interested in business and working in her family's dry goods store and they met and, and then they over time fell in love and they were married. So here you see their wedding photos from 1924. And then a year later, 1925, their daughter, my mother Johanna was born. But tragically, when my mom was uh, only a month old, her mother Berta, she died from a, uh, a complication of childbirth. It was a severe infection and she didn't survive it. 
So lovingly, her father, Alfred, raised Johanna with a lot of support and help and love from a large extended family. And in each of these photos, the little child that you see is Johanna. She was particularly close to her grandmother, her paternal grandmother, Anna Stern. And Anna played a pivotal role in Johanna's journey to freedom. So looking at Germany as a whole uh, after World War I, life was very hard. Uh, they, after their defeat in the war, they were suffering through crippling economic times and political instability. And this was all, of course, in the midst of the Great Depression. So many Germans blamed the Jews for their situation. The Jews were the scapegoats, as well as the communists and the socialists. And in this photo, you see this incredibly long unemployment line. And then uh, painted on the side of the building is, uh, are the words, vote Hitler. So the message being a vote for Hitler would be a solution to their problems. And now you'll hear from my mom. Well, I was born in 1925 and Hitler came in 1933. So, I guess for the first eight years, things just went along like, you know, I played like children do, I went to school like children do, and then things started to change for me. What were the reasons for the change? A rise in anti-Semitism in Germany. Hey, Beverly. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but um, there is a strange uh, rectangle on top of some of your slides, and I'm wondering if you could try moving your cursor just a bit to the to the left, um, do you see a settings a Zoom settings bar on your screen? Yeah. So everything is on the the. I everything the whole mute stop video. It's all on the top. So how could I? Do you want me to get rid of that? If possible. And this didn't make anything better. Um, um, you you clicked out of one of the settings, so that was good. It is a bit better. Is do you do you uh, see a? I'm ah, there we go. Okay, so now that the that menu now you, is on the bottom is that bothering? Is that uh, it think? may be slightly um in the way, but I think it will be less of a hindrance for your slide titles. So let's just leave it at that. And why don't you continue with your presentation? Oh, okay. I'm so sorry about that. Don't don't worry. This this is a strange thing that happens sometimes, and it's a bit hard to troubleshoot. Um, so so don't worry at all. Just keep okay. on going, and it's much better. Okay. All right. Thank <laughs> Thanks, Beverly. So as I was saying, the reason for the changes in Johanna's uh, life and the world around her was the rise in anti-Semitism in Germany. Certainly anti-Semitism had existed in Europe for hundreds of years, but with the creation of the Nazi party and uh, with uh, Adolf Hitler at its head, uh, things, uh, things really increased. Uh, he, he believed in these theories of extreme nationalism and espoused these beliefs in a false uh, idea of a, a master Aryan race. And he thought that the Jews were a threat to the purity of that uh, master race. And then you, you see in this photo on the right from 1938 Vienna, Austria, the dog is permitted to sit on the bench and the label on the bench reads only for Aryans. So the message being that it's uh, it's okay for animals to sit on the bench and they deserve more respect and, and more rights uh, than a Jew. Okay, now, <laughs> now, oh my goodness. Now I'm not able to, uh, to forward. Try clicking your mouse on the slide, Beverly. Is that not doing it? Okay. Thank there we go. Oh my goodness. I appreciate everyone's patience. And um, 
when we reached the 1933, the Nazis became the majority uh, governing party in Germany and Hitler was appointed chancellor. And in this photo, you see him addressing the, the Bundestag, the German parliament. Now, during this time, as Hitler rose to power, there uh, were members of Johanna's family that did leave Germany. And about half of the 523,000 German Jews did escape by 1939. But Alfred stayed. He felt he had too much to lose by leaving, and he especially wanted to maintain the family business. And in this photo, you see uh, the business, Stern and Son. The uh, store was on the main level and the living quarters were above and the, uh, the Stearns owned the whole building where they lived and, and worked. I used to hear my people, older people talking. politics, you know, about this Hitler, and they thought, uh, they thought he was a nut. He was a crazy man, and it wouldn't last long. You know, my father, he had seen from the First World War, he had seen regimes come in, regimes overthrown. So they were just waiting till they, they thought he was a passing face. But what they thought. He would just go. But in no way did they think that it would affect people like us in a small town so established. It just never came up. When Johanna started school, she was enrolled in a small Jewish day school. But when she was about eight years old, Alfred enrolled her in a private German school with more of an academic focus. And at first, uh, all the Jewish and non-Jewish German children, they all got along fine, but within a year, things started to change and Johanna was being teased and bullied and the children who had been her friends just ignored her. She was ex uh, excluded from school activities. And uh, at recess, she was forced to remain under the Judenbaum, under the Jewish tree, because Jewish children were not allowed to socialize or, or play with the other kids at recess. And this all came to a head in November 1938, when Johanna was expelled from school, along with all German Jewish children, they were no longer allowed to attend German Aryan schools. At the same time, their business suffered. They were losing non-Jewish customers. And Alfred and Johanna had been living in a home outside of Bad Neustadt, but they, they moved into uh, the living quarters above the family business. They thought they would be safer there. And at that point in time, Grandma Anna was a widow. And so she was living there and, and they joined her. I was there out of school. It was pretty obvious that the things with my father were uncertain. And I, they just, my grandmother felt I had to get out to safety. Things are getting worse by the day. This was after November 9th. November 9th, what was she referring to? It was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The Nazis organized riots throughout the country. Synagogues were burned. Jewish homes, schools, and businesses were looted or destroyed. Jews were beaten. Many were murdered. And 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and, imp and imprisoned, including... Alfred Stern. So, of course, it was horrifying when Alfred was dragged out of their home in the middle of the night, and he was, uh, he was arrested and put in the local jail. They said he was being held as a political prisoner. And then while he was in jail, the Nazis confiscated the family building. They never paid the Sterns, they just took it. And uh, Anna and Johanna, they were living in fear, not knowing uh, if and when they'd be exiled from their home and they had nowhere else to go and they could hear workmen renovating their business space below. And then they were afraid to go out on the street because Jews were being arrested at any time for any reason. But uh, fortunately, several weeks passed and Alfred was released from jail. And at that point, of course, he knew that the family had to leave Germany. 
But the problem was uh, no solution was simple and no solution was certain. So the solution that Alfred did find for his, uh, his journey to freedom was the sponsorship program. He had remarried and his second wife had an uncle in New York willing to sponsor them. For the American government to allow an American citizen to serve as a sponsor for refugees, the American had to pledge financial support for the refugee, which would become particularly important if the refugee was then able to find a job themselves. So this was, of course, a, a big commitment. And when we think about Anne Frank and her family's story, the reason they were forced into hiding was that they were not uh, able to find sponsors for immigration. And in this photo on the lower right, you see letters that uh, Otto Frank, Anne's father wrote, uh, desperately in search of a sponsor. Now, Grandma Anna, she did not think the sponsorship program was the best option for uh, Johanna. It was just too uncertain. Alfred and his wife were on a wait list to get visas to the US. And if all their uh, documents were approved and their health exams were accepted, they still would be responsible for finding their own transportation to the United States and for paying for it. So. Anna, she just worked tirelessly to find an escape plan for Johanna. And she, uh, she explored any and all possibilities. And the one that did come through was the Kinder Transport Program to Middlesbrough, England. Anna had a distant cousin who was going to immigrate Germany by serving as a house mother in a hostel, a group home that was being formed in Middlesbrough, England for 25 refugee girls. So Anna wrote her cousin asking if Johanna could be included in that group. What was the Kinder Transport Program? It was an incredible rescue operation that was initiated by the British government. It was a response to Kristallnacht. So it began a few days after Kristallnacht and then it ended a few days uh, before England entered the war with Germany. And in that time, they were able to rescue 10,000 children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. The kids were ages one to 17, and Johanna was 14 years old. So um, the British government issued these temporary travel visas for children to, to, to travel alone. And most of them, uh, they never saw their, their homeland or their families again. They were orphans by the end of the war. And of course the Stearns were, were so happy and relieved because they, uh, they knew then that being in the kinder transport program, Johanna would be saved. And these photographs, they show you an example of a girl's, a German girl's passport that was issued. And also uh, there's a photo of Johanna's certificate of health. It was a letter written by her doctor and submitted as part of her kinder transport application. So uh, Alfred received a lot of instructions from the uh, kinder transport organizers. On the left, you see a letter uh, in German, of course, and then it's translated on the right. Uh, he was told that uh, he would bring Johanna to meet a train. The train would originate in Munich and it would stop for her in Frankfurt. She was permitted to bring one suitcase of personal belongings. And that suitcase though would be shipped separately. And that was to meet her at the, uh, at the Middlesbrough train station. And the letter includes that sentence, we hope that everything will work out and we wish you all the best for your child's departure. So Johanna's journey to freedom, it took her from uh, Bad Neustadt and her train to Frankfurt, a train to Holland in the Netherlands and then a, a ship to Harwich, England, and then a train to uh, London and Victoria Station, and then another train ride to Middlesbrough. So Alfred, again, he took her to Frankfurt to meet the train. Uh, Johanna could not speak any English except for one sentence, how do you do? But she carried with her a pocket-sized German English dictionary 
And later she called that her lifesaver. And she wore a sign around her neck with her name, her place of origin and her destination. And as I said, uh, that the uh, journey took her then to London. They took, uh, took us all to Victoria Station and there was a huge auditorium. And then the people who were picking up children, whether they were individuals or Jews or Quakers, it doesn't matter, whoever had, sent, had pledged themselves to take children, they would go up on the stage and they would call out the name and that young person would go up there and then they would collect them. And the whole hall emptied out and there was me, no one had called for me. Finally, at the very end, a man came up on the stage and he did call out my name. I, so I said, uh-uh, I was supposed to have Mrs. Miller, Frau Miller, uh, the rabbi's wife. I don't know you. So he says, yes, I'm her brother, and she couldn't make it, so they sent me. Don't worry, it'll be okay. And it was okay. And she spent the day with the man, and then he put her on an evening train to Middlesbrough, where she was met by a welcoming committee who took her to the hostel, and that ended her two-day journey. My mother said that from the day she arrived in Middlesbrough, she was just surrounded by a kind and compassionate Jewish community. They were her sponsors and her hosts. They called themselves the uh, Jewish Refugee Committee of Middlesbrough. They consisted of 130 families who had pledged support for the 25 girls. And they also just volunteered their time and talents to help the girls in any way possible. And they managed the, uh, the large nice home that had been donated by a Jewish family to serve as the hostel. And then uh, in this photo on the upper right, the red arrow is pointing to Lionel Levy. He was the head of the committee and the other arrow points to my mother. And then also there's several of the other uh, hostel uh, girls live uh, in, the, uh, in the photo. So things were in place for Johanna to adapt to this new life in England, but she was facing two barriers uh, and two obstacles, I would say. One was the, lang the language barrier. Uh, they enrolled all the girls immediately in a public English school, but they couldn't speak the language. So learning was pretty impossible, but Johanna just, uh, she just persevered. She took that dictionary with her wherever she went, asked anyone and everyone for help. She really wanted to teach herself English. And then later she did enroll in night school classes in English. And then the other obstacle that she faced was the fact that she had no belongings except for the clothes on her back. That uh, suitcase was not with her personal possessions. It was not waiting for her at the Middlesbrough train station. So the next day she, uh, she told Lionel Levy through a translator, she told him her problem and he went back to the station with her in search of the missing suitcase. And every day for a week, either he or a family member returned to the station with Johanna in search of the suitcase. And by the end of the week, there was no suitcase, but Johanna was understandably very upset. So in order to, to try to cheer her up, he took her on the weekend on a uh, outing into the countryside. And that was the first of many outings with uh, Johanna and the Levy family. So the misfortune of this missing suitcase became the blessing that started the relationship between Johanna and the Levy's. And then after three weeks of living in the hostel, school let out for summer vacation and Lionel invited her to join his family for a weekend. They had rented a beach cottage on the North Sea in a, in a, a town called Runswig Bay she had a wonderful time and then they all got along so well, they invited her to, to spend the summer with them and live with them. And uh, she was thrilled. She especially loved spending time with the Levy's two daughters. They had three adult children. And in the photo on the left, you see Eddie Levy with her daughters, Pauline and Josie. And they, Pauline and Josie treated Johanna as if she was their little sister and she, they helped her a lot with her English. So um, they're all vacationing, sunbathing on the beach and it's September 3rd, 1939. And they brought a, along a portable radio 
And then uh, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain came on the air and he announced that Great Britain had declared war on Germany. So again, September 3rd, this is two days after uh, Germany had invaded Poland. So the, uh, the Levy family rushed back to Middlesbrough Middle and in a short time, all their children were called into military service. And during that time, there was a lot of correspondence, a lot of letter writing between uh, Johanna, the Levies, and Alfred Stern. Uh, he wrote Johanna, and he let her know that miraculously, he and his wife had made it to the United States uh, just shortly before uh, Germany went to war. And so they were among the, the last Jews to escape Germany. And right away, Alfred enrolled Johanna in the sponsorship program and applied for a visa for her. But by the time the visa arrived, it was too dangerous for her to travel across the Atlantic Ocean to the US. And that was, that was marked by a tragedy where a British ship that was evacuating British kids to Canada, it was torpedoed and sunk by the Nazis. So, um, the, uh, the Levies, I mean, nobody knew how long the, the war would last, maybe a number of months, maybe a year. And thinking that, the Levies, they wrote Alfred and invited Johanna to stay with them until it was safe to travel. And then he wrote back, and of course, he was extremely grateful and, and for, their, for their help. So my mother started as a weekend guest of the Levy family, and she ended up living with them for seven years, virtually as their daughter. I, I do wanna tell you a little bit about Grandma Anna, Anna Stern. Um, things became very dire for her after Alfred and Johanna uh, escaped from Germany. Uh, she, the Nazis, uh, they expelled her from her home in Bad Neustadt. She fled to Mons, Germany to live with her sister and brother-in-law. And after a, uh, a short time, the Nazis imprisoned the three of them and they sent them to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. So that was a transit camp that sent many of its prisoners on to killing centers like Auschwitz. But when she first arrived in Theresienstadt, the Nazis did allow Anna to write to her, her three sisters in Switzerland. And they then communicated with Alfred in New York, uh, news of Anna. But after a time, all communication just ended. So throughout the war, Johanna just hoped and prayed that she would be reunited with her grandmother when the war ended. So my mother, Johanna, she uh, lived in England from age 14 to 21. She grew up there. So when you look at these photos on the lower or to the left, you see her as the German Fraulein with the braids down to her, uh, to her waist when she first arrived. And then she grew up into an adult and her, her hairstyle, her clothing style, they all became more English. And the, the Levies were wonder, wonderful to her. They provided her with everything that she needed, anything that she wanted. And then their family friends became her friends. So there's a photo in the top center and my mother's on the left in the, in the black pants and she's golfing with her friends. But uh, when, she, uh, when she did arrive, a priority was certainly her schooling, her education. But the, the private or, and the uh, public English schools, they didn't work because of the language barrier. So when she was almost 15 years old, Lionel Levy enrolled her in a commercial college. This was a one-year secretarial program and when she completed it, she wanted more skills and she was particularly interested in accounting. So when she was almost 16 years old, he helped her get a job with Jasper Hood, their family accountant. And I should mention that during those times in England, it was not unusual for teenagers to leave school and to learn a trade or to get a job. So she uh, worked for for this accounting firm, she started as a clerk. She would answer their uh, switchboard phones and type letters. But over the years, her responsibilities and her skills just increased. And by the time she left England, she was the office manager and secretary to the accountants. 
she supervised all the staff and did all the bookkeeping and helped with the, with the auditing and the accounting. But the whole time she lived in England, she was still uh, an enemy alien. And um, here I was, a, a German, as far as you know, uh, the country was concerned. I was an alien. Didn't that was the biggest conflict? It didn't matter that the country where I was born didn't want me. I was an alien in the country where I found refuge. And Johanna, she understood the dilemma for uh, the British for the British government. Um, infiltration by spies was a serious threat, and they could not easily tell the difference between a friendly spy or a friendly alien and a, uh, a hostile alien. So she, uh, here you see that uh, passport, the special passport she was issued, and she had to follow a curfew. And then uh, there's an additional certificate of identity that she had to carry with her. And uh, then uh, the United States opened an Air Force base in Middlesbrough. So that became a potential uh, target for enemy bombings. And there were times when the British families had to evacuate their children from Middlesbrough for safety. And at one point in time, Eddie Levy did take Johanna to Blackpool, uh, a seaside town. And uh, they stayed there for a month until the danger subsided. And when they had returned to Millersboro, Lionel Levy had built a bomb shelter under their garage and they spent many sleepless nights there. And then he volunteered as a air raid va uh, warden and he patrolled their neighborhood at night. And here's a photo of a bomb shelter in London under a, a subway station. So 1945, the war finally did end and uh, Tragically, Johanna did learn the fate of her relatives who had been left behind in Germany. And one time was after the war, I had a letter from my aunt in New York, who had, my, had been, she was my mother's sister, and she sent me this list of our relatives and their name, their date of birth, and where she knew the last residence. And she said she heard that in London from the Red Cross and Hyas, they had organized, there was a place where you could trace people. And I had this long list and I really went through each one. It took me hours and I came up, I was so sure that I could find somebody and I found no one, just no one. And on that same devastating trip, she found uh, out about a Grandma Anna. Grandma Anna had died at Theresienstadt when she was 71 years old. She was uh, forced to uh, endure deplorable living conditions and sleep and do hard labor during the day, sleep on wooden benches at night, and a splinter of wood lodged uh, from one of those benches lodged under her skin. And it caused a severe infection and nobody would treat it and she died. So Johanna, overcome by grief, uh, she was still able to leave London and return to Middlesbrough. And then it was with that, the love and, and comfort and support of the Levies and of her friends that she managed to carry on. She knew that her grandmother would want her to carry on and, and to face her future. And so she did. Now with the end of the war, the hostel closed and Johanna was asked to represent all 25 girls and give a speech of gratitude to the community. And it was held at the Middlesbrough Synagogue. And afterwards she took excerpts of her speech and included the names of each of the girls. And she created a plaque that was uh, hung, it was hung as a permanent remembrance in the entrance to the synagogue. And then it was time for Johanna to plan her journey to America. Uh, certainly she wanted to reunite with her dad, but also she was very much anxious to, to look to the US as a permanent homeland. And she knew it would take five years to become a naturalized citizen. So she was anxious to, to get the process started. But uh, she had a lot of challenges with her visa and with transportation. She, um, 
she was on this last reissue of the visa. Every time Alfred had issued one, it would expire because she was unable to travel. It wasn't safe for her to utilize it. And as I said, it was on the last reissue. So she knew this was her last opportunity. And then the, uh, the transportation was very challenging because right after the war, there was no uh, transportation by, uh, by sea or by air for civilians to get uh, to the US. But she persevered and she did get a ticket on one of the first uh, non-military personnel flights. And uh, she had a, a complicated itinerary and a lot of weather delays, but uh, she made it. She went from England then and, and flew to Chicago and then flew directly on to New York to reunite with her father and start the next chapter of her life. And now I'll introduce you to my dad, Malcolm Moss. My father was born Moses Moskowitz and he changed his name shortly after he arrived in the United States. He was born in Tarnow, Poland, a, a small city in Southern Poland, about 45 miles from Krakow. Before the war, the population of Tarnow was 50,000 and half of those people were Jews. And then after the war, almost all the Jews had been murdered. And then there's a photo here of my grandparents, uh, Leah and Herman Moskowitz, they, uh, they in turn of my uh, grandfather, Herman was a custom tailor and Leah was an expert seamstress. And in that time in Tarnoff, a lot of the Jews, Jewish people were working in the clothing business. From a, a young age, my father was interested in athletics and in art. He was very athletic and, and very artistic. And even in high school, he apprenticed with a tailor because he wanted to learn how clothing was made. And then when he completed high school, he studied at the Vienna Academy of Design in Vienna, Austria, where his older brother Manny was living. My father was one of four children. He was the youngest and Manny was the oldest and the only relative to survive. He also had a brother, Oscar, who was a clothing designer and he had a sister, Sabina, married to David. And then he had two nephews, Sabina and David's sons, uh, Isaac and Zygmunt. And the last time my dad saw the boys alive, they were eight years old. So after finishing his studies in Vienna, my dad uh, wanted to move to Zurich, Switzerland, he, where Manny was living. And uh, the Swiss government though, they did not want foreigners to uh, permanently settle, especially Ju uh, Jewish settlers, Jewish immigrants. They didn't want them to permanently settle in Switzerland. So they would not issue him a work permit. So he came up with another plan. He uh, was going to return to Poland and live and work in Warsaw and start a clothing design business with Oscar. So he went to Warsaw and he went to the studio space, but he never followed through with the plan. He just did not feel safe. He felt um, very much the threat of an impending invasion of Poland by uh, Germany. And so he fled to back to Zurich, Switzerland. His parents begged him to stay, but he left. And he never saw them alive, uh, alive again. Uh, they wrote to each other. And uh, as things got worse in Poland, they begged for help to get Swiss visas. And that was impossible. And then he would send them food and provisions. But after a time, all communications ended. And when he got to the US, he was in New York and he worked with the Red Cross and other agencies trying to track his family, but they had all been murdered. And my dad lived with the grief from that loss for, for the rest of his life. So his journey had taken him from Tarnow, Poland to study in Vienna, Austria, returned to Warsaw for a short time, and then he fled to Zurich, Switzerland, where he remained throughout the war. The war began shortly after my father got to Switzerland, and he was one of 22,000 Jews who were interned in a Swiss labor uh, camp. So this photo shows 
him digging ditches. Uh, the red arrow points to him in the center in the, in the white shirt. So he was doing hard labor, but after a time, he did convince the authorities that he did have a skill to share with the other refugees. He could teach them pattern making and tailoring. So they allowed him to do that. And here you see he's on the far right in that white lab coat teaching the refugees. And the Swiss designer who supervised my father, he was impressed with his skills. And he asked him to co-author a book on pattern making and to teach a class at a well-known design college where he worked. So based on those experiences, finally the Swiss government uh, did issue my father a work permit. So my dad was able to leave the labor camp in 1942, and then he was empl employed by a Swiss manufacturer designing women's coats and suits. But the whole time my dad lived in Switzerland, he wanted to get to the United States. Uh, his brother Manny had immigrated in 1938 from Switzerland to uh, the US and he wanted to join him. But the transportation, getting a visa in addition to getting transportation was very difficult, but my father, he did persevere. And in September, 1945, he uh, had his visa and his transportation. He took a train from Zurich to Madrid, Spain, and another train to Lisbon, Portugal. And he started this uh, voyage from Lisbon, Portugal. He took a ship to Philadelphia but it, it, uh, it actually took a month because there was an extended stay in Cuba. From Philadelphia, he uh, went right on to New York and joined his brother and began his, his life in America. Shortly after my father arrived, he started working as a, a, woman, a woman's coat and suit designer in New York. He met my mother who had only been in the United States for a few months. They dated and fell in love and, and they were married. So here you see their wedding photo and their wedding invitation. And my parents had three children. So here they are with my older brother, John, and with baby me. And then later when they lived in Chicago, my sister, their youngest child was born. And here's a newspaper ad showing you two of my father's creations. It's from Rothmore Corporation, where he was the head designer in, in Chicago. While living in New York, my parents both became naturalized citizens. And then my father's career took them across the United States. They started in the East Coast in New York and then lived for many years in the Midwest, in Chicago for almost 20 years and then in DeKalb, Illinois, which is in Northern Illinois and also in Kansas City. And then they retired on the West Coast in 1982 in San Diego. But my father loved designing. So he still uh, worked part-time. He would go to uh, Los Angeles to do some part-time teaching and some freelance design work. My father died when he was 74 years old and he was a great dad. Uh, he was a, a loving husband and father and grandfather. And we have wonderful family memory, memories of all our time together. And my mother, she died when she was 94 years old. That was in 2019. And she was a, a, a loving wife and mother and grandmother and also a great grandmother. She devoted her life to her family and also uh, to community service. She did a great deal of volunteer work and she maintained her relationship with the Levy's relatives throughout their lives. And today uh, my family has relationships with the Levy's grandchildren and great grandchildren. So the, the bond that my mom created all those years ago, it still lives on today. And then uh, I'll share some parting thoughts from my mother. All these things I told you about, uh, they're stored in my memory. I just never forget. And all these people that were really dear to me, uh, I don't forget them. Because they might be gone from this earth, but they're certainly not gone from my memory.
thank you for watching. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beverly, for these amazing stories of both of your parents. I have a couple questions for you here. Um, the first one is comes from Linda and she asks, what was the name of the camp, if you know it, in Switzerland where your father was interned? I don't know, but I have a lot of documents that, um, that need to be translated. So I appreciate that question. And um, I will I will follow up on that. Maybe we'll see what we can find out. Um, another another question that I've that I'm wondering is how did you learn of your parents' stories and their history with the Holocaust? Did you know it as a child or was it presented to you later in life? And what was it like knowing that your parents had gone through this? It was, there wasn't a day, uh, a specific day or time. It was just um, part of our identity and part of their identity. Um, and I'm just thinking um, things like um, the relatives who were alive and the relatives who weren't, that would be um, probably one of the, the signature ways that, that I learned their story. Um, and then the those letters in those uh, the old the old school blue uh, airmail letters uh, constantly back and forth from England and my mother's friends and her uh, and her uh, close relationship with the Levies and all those uh, other friends she had made those were just you know part of uh, of our life too um, so, so it, it was very um, it was just very natural and just not one day where anything was uh, was announced. Um, there was uh, an understanding though, that there was a sensitivity. Um, my father, uh, my mother would kind of, uh, she would be the one who would say, uh, she'd be concerned about a television show he was watching or a book he was reading. And she would say, this is gonna give you nightmares. So mm -hmm. as I think about it now as an adult, there must have been nightmares. Um, you know that part I wasn't exposed to. I was only, uh, you know, exposed to to hearing her, uh, you know, try to uh, to kind of shelter him and uh, try to direct him so things would be more comfortable. Um, so mm -hmm. I remember, I remember that. But um, I, w I was always really uh, proud of my parents. Um, I felt I knew their story, and I felt that I really admired um, their courage to persevere and their resilience. And I, I really respected them for that. But I will say though, as a child, you know, at least for me as a child, um, I wanted to be like everyone else. So um, I was aware of their accents. And so that, uh, it was just something I, I, was, I was aware of. I am not saying, I wasn't to the point of being embarrassed, but I knew that my parents uh, were different than other people in that way. Uh, I happened to grow up, uh, the north side of Chicago in a very Jewish neighborhood. So um, I, I was not um, different because I was Jewish, but I, I, to some extent, was different because I was a first-generation American. Mm -hmm. I wonder too, Beverly, can you tell us a little bit about what your mom, Johanna's experience was like when she came to the United States and saw her father again after seven years? I mean, as a as a parent of teenagers, I can't imagine what it would be like to be separated for seven years and then how to rebuild that relationship. So I wonder what was that like for them and were they able to maintain a relationship after that? I think it, it was all, it was very positive. I think the fact that they were able to write during the war, throughout the war and kept in contact that way, um, and she actually, she met um, my father two months after she arrived and uh, she had a job. So I think she really at that point was an adult and she, she had left, uh, lived her whole life, particularly with the kinder transport experience. She was very independent. And so, um, you know, just like so many other survivors, she grew up uh, because she had to, she grew up pretty, pretty fast. So um, again, there was always the affection for each other and the, ongoing communication. And even I remember um, when we uh, lived in Chicago, I remember visits from my grandfather and there was the phone call. So the relationship 
um, it was always maintained, but she arrived as an adult. And so maybe that was different than, mm -hmm. than the, uh, she was not dependent uh, on, on her father, but mm -hmm. she, very glad to see him. <laughs> yeah. So Beverly has one last question. What, what do you think your mom and dad and you also would want our audience here and future generations to take away from this story and their experiences? And I, I appreciate that, that question. I think um, one thing uh, that I would hear from my, well, my parents um, was sort of the power of the individual and anything that you can do to, um, to direct your future and um, not to try not to be a victim and that kind of uh, uh, pride in, in yourself and that kind of source of direction, that was something that meant a lot to them. And they also saw you know, the worst and the best in people. So they still you know, had, uh, believed in, in the, you know, the basic good nature of people. And then um, I, think, I think that was about it. Although lastly, my mother just would talk a lot about kind of the golden rule, just mm -hmm. that desire and that message just to treat people as you would want to be treated. And uh, that was something that kind of guided my upbringing too. That's such a powerful message. That Beverly, thank you so, so much for putting this all together and for sharing these stories today. We really, really appreciate it. And I, I look forward to hearing more and kind of digging more into the stories too. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all for joining today's program and whether you are watching this live or maybe at a later date, we are so glad you are here to learn with us and to hear these incredible stories like Beverly's and her parents. One of the biggest compliments you can give us is to share a program with a friend or a colleague or a family member, send them a link to a program or invite them to join live on a Tuesday um, or share it on your social media pages and tag the Holocaust Center for Humanity. This helps others to find our programs. This program was recorded and you will find it on our website starting tomorrow. Please join us for our next Lunch and Learn program on September 20th with Jack Shalom, who will tell us about his mother Magda, who as a teenager in Hungary was deported to Auschwitz. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible, of course, because of all of you who are tuning in and because we have a fantastic team at the Holocaust Center. Thank you to Julia Thompson and Morgan Romero on our education team who are running the technical side of this show behind the scenes. And a huge thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon, who steers this ship with determination and passion and to our entire team, Richard Green, Lori Werschel cohen Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Amanda Davis, Devonshire Locke, Katie Lawrence, and Branda Anderson. Thank you again for joining today's program, and we hope to see you at our next Lunch and Learn program on September 20th. And this concludes our program for today. <laughs>